Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Cindy Combs. I'm a master gardener with Washington State University Extension in Clark County, Washington. I received my training in 2008 in Seattle, where I lived at the time. But when I moved to Vancouver in 2017, I asked the Clark County Master Gardeners if they would adopt me, and they said they would. So I am super happy about that because it gives me the opportunity to be here with you today. Our topic is color. I don't know about you, but when I first started gardening, my focus was on creating a colorful garden using flowers. But I soon discovered it was really difficult to keep the flower color going, so I thought there had to be another way. What we're going to talk about today is taking a seasonal approach to adding color to your garden. During our discussion, we'll review how to determine where and when you need more color and explore three possible solutions. We'll talk about plants, of course, and we'll look at examples of how other gardeners have succeeded in using a seasonal approach. And finally, I'll share with you some tips and techniques that hopefully will help you succeed in adding more color to your garden. Now, I don't know where you are on your quest for more color, so I would ask that you answer these three questions for yourself. When you do, it will help you clarify how our discussion today might help you. And the first of these questions is, what time of the year does your garden lack color? Secondly, what specific area or areas of your garden need more color? And third, do you currently use garden art, structures, or containers for color accents? We're going to focus on two distinctly different areas when we talk about color, and the first of these is the entryway to your home. This area is often ignored because many of us tend to think about our backyards as being our gardens, but more color to enhance the entryway of your home can create a beautiful environment not only for you to enjoy, but also for your visitors and neighbors to enjoy as well. The other area we're going to talk about is the view out your most important window. When thinking about color, it is important to consider that what we see out the window is how we experience the garden so many months of the year. So although we'll be focusing on these two situations, please keep in mind that any of the ideas we discuss today very likely will apply to any area of the garden where you need more color. So a place to start is to pinpoint what the garden is lacking before we can figure out what we need to do. So for example, if this was our entryway, where would we want to add more color? It's a pretty blank slate at the moment. So let's focus on whether or not we would like to have color at the foundation or on the walkway to the front door. Do we want it in the driveway area or near the garage door? Do we want it at the front door on the porch or in the lawn. If this were our entryway garden, we might ask ourselves, do we want more color? Do we need more color? It's certainly a beautiful garden with lots of evergreens and different shades of green and gold and blue. And the plants are in different sizes and textures and shapes. But is this how we want it to look 365 days of the year? And if not, then we might ask ourselves, where do we want more color and when do we want it? Say this is the view out the kitchen window. We just purchased this house and we really love the fact that the backyard had a lot of privacy, but it doesn't have much color. So let's ask ourselves, where would we want to put more color? Would it be in the foreground just outside the windows or would it be in the middle ground or in the far distance? Do we want more colorful plants in the hedgerow on the property boundary, or do we just want to paint the shed? If we looked out the window and we saw this view, well, we would be saying to ourselves, I'm pretty happy about this garden, but I'd like to see a little more color in spring, summer, and fall. Many of us deal with this kind of a situation. It's the early days of spring and there's just a little spring color popping up, but there's not really much to compel us to look out the window at this time of the year. So we might ask ourselves, how can we bridge the gap as we wait for more plants to grow and bloom? And kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum, we have a beautiful perennial garden that has faded after a couple of months of dry, hot weather. 
What can we do to improve this situation? And many of us rely on containers of annuals for color, but that color eventually comes to an end as well. So how do we color the picture? Well, first we need to accept that flower color can only take us so far if we want color in all seasons. And if that is the case, we need to look for alternatives. So today we're going to discuss three possible solutions. The first of these is to plant evergreens for year-round structure and color. The second is to add deciduous plants with multiple seasons of interest. And the third is to incorporate colorful non-living elements. So let's start off with our first solution, adding evergreens, the workhorse to the all-season garden. Now the definition of an evergreen plant is any plant that retains its leaves or needles throughout the year and into the following growing season. So this includes not only conifers, such as we see on the left here with the beautiful Serbian spruce, but also broadleaf evergreens, such as the Pieris in the center here, and evergreen perennials, such as the Parahebe on the right. Evergreen plants can be green, of course, but there are also many different colors of evergreen plants to incorporate into the garden. So with thoughtful choices, we can really pump up the color quotient using evergreens. There is a subset of evergreen plants, and those are the ones that have the wonderful quality of changing color through the course of the year. You get bonus points if you choose plants with this quality because you will have two colors or more as the year goes along. Microbiota de Casada has green leaves three seasons out of the year, but in cold weather, it turns a rich copper color. Albilia cross grandiflora kaleidoscope is a broadleaf evergreen that has constantly changing colors of leaves. In spring, the leaves are green with subtle yellow variegations. Then in summer, the leaves become more variegated in rich golds and reds that really show off the starry white flowers. And then by late summer and through fall and winter, you'll have a shrub that is ablaze with colors of deep burgundy, deep red, deep orange, lovely gold with hints of green. Multiple seasons of color, all in one plant. There's also another subset of evergreen plants, and those are the ones with multiple seasons of interest. Yes, you may have evergreen foliage of one color, but this plant will give you something, something special in one of the seasons of the year. Loripetalum chinensis is Ever burgundy. It has beautiful burgundy leaves that persist throughout the year, but in spring it has a flush of frizzy pink flowers. And once those flowers fade, you'll go back to enjoying the ever burgundy color, but also those little flowers will return from time to time all the way up until frost. Azara microphylla variegata also has something, something special. As you can see on the right, it has tiny little leaves, green rimmed with gold, and the tree itself has a very open and airy habit, but its secret is that it has flowers in January, and they're so secret you may not even notice them until you smell them. And depending on your nose, you'll smell either chocolate or vanilla. Our second solution to add more color is to consider using deciduous plants that have multiple seasons of interest, such as a combination of flowers, fruits or berries, fall color, interesting bark, or great form, all in one specimen. One example of this is the flowering crabapple Adirondack. It has gorgeous white flowers in spring, followed by pink crabapples that form in summer and are beautifully contrasted against the green foliage. And then once the leaves fall, you have branches festooned with little marble-sized pink crab apples that persist into the winter for just an additional season of color. Corniscusa Milky Way has white bracts in summer that just cover the tree. Those are followed by fleshy red fruit. And then in autumn, the tree will just be ablaze in colors of crimson, orange, and gold. Stewardia pseudocamellia on the left here blooms in summer with white camellia-like flowers and has unusual camouflage-patterned bark. 
The queen of trees with beautiful bark has to be the paper bark maple on the right. This graceful tree seen here in autumn has bark that exfoliates in tissue paper thin cinnamon colored strips that glow in the winter sun. Some deciduous plants give us unusual structure. The quirky silhouette of the contorted filbert is highlighted even more with an evergreen background. And imagine your delight when you look out the window in February and you see the pale yellow catkins hanging on these leafless branches. Our third solution is to look for non-living elements that can bring color to our garden. Plants aren't always the only answer to making our gardens more colorful. What about adding color on your arbors, pergolas, gazebos, deck railings, trellises, screens? If you don't have these types of structures, you may want to add them and let's get out the paint and give ourselves an instant boost of color. Here we see a wall has been painted in a dusky shade of purple and it is a wonderful interest 365 days of the year and it also shows this garden off to great effect. On the right we see a whimsically painted shed that brings long-lasting color to an area of the garden that is otherwise pretty green. And who says that fences and gates need to be either white or brown? I think we should think about adding color to our fences and gates as well. Why not? Even smaller items can provide colorful structure in our gardens. I know few of us have time to sit in our gardens or rock on the front porch, but nonetheless, let's use these items to add some color to our garden, such as we see here with Robin's egg blue rocking chairs with yellow pillows with a yellow plant stand propped up against the house. Long lasting color using non-leaving elements. And who wouldn't smile to see this sunny yellow bench outside the window? Me personally, I would like a throne. Beautiful glass artwork and colorful bird baths and water bowls and other types of artwork can add multiple seasons of interest. Of course, we want to take into account their durability to handle the weather, but even if they're used for three seasons, that still gives you long lasting color. Isn't this bird beautiful? I saw this at the National Botanic Garden of Ireland in Dublin. It really added a lovely moment of color and shine in an area that was primarily green. Adding colorful birdhouses, bird feeders, and similar items serves a dual purpose, right? It provides color and it attracts more wildlife to our gardens. And who would not want to add containers for color? Empty or filled with plants, containers are very versatile and effective for adding your favorite color where and when you need it. Here's a creative example of how a container was used as a base of a table that serves as a colorful accent year round. And on the left, we can see that it's set for alfresco dining. And please do note the painted screen in the background. And on the right, a little wintertime vignette. Now that we've looked at these three options for adding color, how much evergreen or permanent color do you need to get you through spring, summer, fall, and winter? Well, if it's a very visible area, such as the entryway to your home, I would suggest you shoot for 80% of the space, be devoted to evergreen plants and or non-living elements. This is totally achievable and it still gives you 20% of your garden space for those plants that have shorter seasons of color, such as bulbs, deciduous trees and shrubs, herbaceous perennials and annuals. If you're looking out the window, I would suggest one third of the plants or non-living elements take up the composition. And this will help you sustain color and bridge the seasons. I wanted to show you this slide of a young garden because I wanted to remind myself to remind you that establishing evergreen presence does not happen overnight. You just need to envision the space that they will eventually take up. Now I'll show you quickly where those evergreens are in this young garden. And then I'll show you later in summer where you can definitely see that the perennial grass and herbaceous shrubs and the perennials are the stars of the show. 
But the evergreens are still there and they are going to help you bridge the gap season to season and give you color throughout. So, are you still with me? Let's talk about some more plants. Now, you remember the question that I asked you at the beginning of the talk, the one that was, what time of the year does your garden lack color? Well, if you answered winter, you are in the majority. So let's talk about winter. Now, please remember, as we go through these plants, consider your project area and right plant, right place. My time is quite limited today, so I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, and I won't have time to give you all the details for each plant. So if something catches your eye, please do further research before shopping. Let's start with a couple of evergreen trees. The first, Serbian spruce. It is probably my all-time favorite because not only is it green, but it has needles that have a silver underside and the tree itself has branches that are upswept, so you can see that silver on the undersides, and it really provides a wonderful bitoned effect, and it looks glorious when the wind blows. Suppressus macrocarpa, Wilma goldcrest, is a dwarf conifer with tight foliage on upswept branches. It is primarily yellow with just a little bit of a green tint. And yellow is such a great color to include in the garden because it stands out like a beacon and gives the impression that a shaft of sunlight is falling on your garden. Broadleaf trees can also provide color throughout the year. And let me just talk for a moment about camellias. Now, technically camellias are a shrub, but many of us think about them as small evergreen trees. There are a number of species, and depending on which one you choose, not only are you going to get shiny evergreen leaves year-round, but you also get flowers. And the flowers may appear in late fall and early winter, or the flowers may appear in late winter and early spring. This is an example of a semi-double camellia donation, and it blooms in pink. Another broadleaf evergreen tree that you might want to consider is Magnolia virginiana, Jim Wilson, sometimes sold under the trade name Moonglow. It has green leaves with silver undersides that again sparkle when the wind blows. And when crushed, the leaves smell like bay leaf. And in the summer, you get these lovely cup-shaped flowers that smell like lemon. Evergreen shrubs are very useful in our winter garden as well. And here is one, Papus Sitka spruce. It would bring quite a lot of blue into the scene because it doesn't stay as small as the name might imply. It gets six feet tall and six feet wide but it is a lovely plant, there's no doubt about that. If you want something a little shorter, you might want to consider Podocarpus Lorenzii Blue Gem. It stays low and mounding, but it has another secret. It's one of those plants that has multiple seasons of color. Its new growth is red. And no Pacific Northwest garden would be complete without at least one rhododendron. But many hybrids are under threat from Rhodi lacebug and Azalea lacebug. This one is resistant because it has a furry coating on the undersides of the leaves. This coating is called indumentum and it protects the leaves from sucking insects. Rhododendron teddy bear is aptly named because the indumentum is brown. And although you get evergreen color, you also get spring blossoms in pale pink. Nandinas are also a popular choice for evergreen color in the Pacific Northwest. But if you happen to be listening to this lecture and you live in another part of the country, I would encourage you to check with your local authorities to see if Nandina is invasive in your area. No such determination has yet been made by Washington State University Extension. And when I checked with Oregon State University, they said that they hadn't seen a problem occur, but they did suggest being cautious. And so they thought maybe the better choice would be to select a Nandina that does not flower or fruit. So let me show you Gulf Stream. 
Gulf Stream, as you can see, is a nice mounded shrub and it has, it's just packed with leaves. The new growth are, is bronze with orange tints. Those new leaves fade to blue green, but then in winter, the shrub will take on highlights of red. I don't know any, if any of you grow this plant, but you may want to when you learn the Daphne odora aria marginata has shiny evergreen leaves edged in yellow. And in February, it blooms with little bouquets of pink flowers that smell like you just walked into a florist shop. This shrub has gray green leaves on low arching branches, which form tight thickets, which make it an excellent barrier for below a window or an excellent hedge. This is Cotone Aster glaucophyllus. It has clusty clusters of showy white flowers in spring, and by late summer, each branch will be sparkling with bright ember red berries. Now, while we're on the subject of evergreen, it might be prudent for me to remind you that evergreens provide great habitat for our overwintering wildlife. And if you happen to have winter blooming flowers, then you are providing nectar for our anise hummingbirds and those lazy bees that come out on a warmer, sunny winter's day. And if your plant has berries, then of course you're providing forage for the overwintering birds. And one more shrub to show you that blooms in winter. This is Erica carnea, Porter's Red. It's the winter blooming heath. Heaths and heathers are sometimes confused, but if you want something that blooms in winter, look for a winter blooming heath. This one has deep pink flowers that persist for months and months, and once they fade, you'll have a tidy little shrub that's only about six inches tall and a foot or a foot and a half wide. Evergreen perennials can provide wonderful interest in the winter as well, and the hot, hot winter blooming evergreen perennial is the hellebore. Many different cultivars and varieties have been put, brought to market in the last several years, and you can find them in colors from deep dusky purple to pale pinks, deep pinks, pale yellow, white, by color, I mean, the choices are immense. Get to a garden center and see what you can find um, when they are at their height of bloom, which can vary from December timeframe through January, February, and March. And depending on the plant that you buy, you're going to find that those flowers persist for a good six to eight weeks. I like ivory prints because it is white, with just a little hint of pink on the back sides of the petals. White, I think, is excellent for winter because it shows up on a gloomy, dreary day. Another perennial to consider for winter is Burginia cordifolia. It has shiny evergreen leaves that turn burgundy or bronze in the cold winter months. And then in March, the plant will send up stems of these tiny little pink flowers. Depending on which one you choose, it could be light pink, medium pink, dark pink, or almost mauve. And it has a common name pig squeak, and do you know why? Because if you take your thumb and your forefinger and you hold on to one of those leaves and rub tightly, it will squeak. Hookahs are another popular category of evergreen perennials, and many, many varieties have been introduced to the market in the last dozen years or so. I like this one. This is Hookera sachet. I like it because it returns reliably year after year, unlike some of the newer introductions that are a little bit more colorful. This one has green leaves with scalloped edges and purple on the reverse of the leaves. It does get tiny white flowers in summer, and what you see on this photo is frost has collected along the edges of the plant, creating a wonderful effect for wintertime. So as not to give the colorful hookah as a complete pass, here's cherry cola. The experts at Seabright Garden and Nursery attest to the staying power of hookah cherry cola, so you might want to give it a try. And as you can see here, the flowers are nearly the same color as the leaves. Did you know that there was an iris that blooms through the winter time? 
Yes, it's Iris unguicularis. In October or early November, you may begin to see buds forming in the center of the clump of grassy evergreen foliage. By Christmas time or so, you're going to see flowers start to bloom and they will be two inches across, light lavender purple with white, and they will be fragrant. And you'll continue to see flowers all the way up until about the first part of April, unless temperatures drop below 15 degrees. The flowers will take a little break at that time, but they'll come back once it starts warming up. Evergreen ground covers are a very important category of plant to add to your garden. You know, I think so many of us are disappointed in our gardens in winter because there's so much bare ground. Ground covers can really solve that problem. So I'm going to show you a few that you might want to consider. And the first of these is Waldstinia ternata. This is my favorite. It has shiny evergreen leaves that resemble strawberry plants. And it has yellow flowers in June, also that resemble strawberry plant flowers. But it will not bear any fruit, hence the common name barren strawberry. What it will do is it will put all its energy into creating a pool of beautiful shiny green foliage that will stretch four feet in every direction once you give it a little time to mature. If you want a fluffy evergreen ground cover, Veronica pedunculares, Georgia blue might be one to try. It has tiny little green leaves on wiry stems and those leaves turn bronze in wintertime. It has a special season of interest though because it also gets masses of blue flowers in April and those little blue flowers will appear from time to time throughout the year. If you have dry shade, Epimedium is the genus that you should be looking for. There are many different species of epimediums. Most of them have heart-shaped leaves, as you see here, sometimes edged with a contrasting color. And in early spring, they have small flowers that appear on delicate stems, sometimes nestled among the leaves, but most of the time rising above. And you can find all different choices of colors for the flowers, including red, orange, yellow, pink, purple, and white, and bicolor. Evergreen shrubs can also provide us with ground cover. Arctolostophilus uva ursi, Massachusetts is one of those. The other is Vancouver jade, and they'll appear quite similar, but Vancouver jade is susceptible to a condition called gall, and that will cause a deformity on the plant. It's not necessarily life-threatening, but it is kind of an aesthetic issue. So Massachusetts is the better of the two to choose for your ground cover. And as you can see, it has tiny little green leaves, pink lantern type of flowers in spring, and those are followed by berries in fall. Junipers can be used as ground covers as well. I know some of you are probably raising your eyebrows to think I would even suggest a juniper, but there are some really good ones. And the secret to a beautiful juniper is to just let them grow naturally and not try to prune them. Dobbs Frosted is lovely because it has gold foliage on the upper branches. And then those that are shaded down below are green. So it gives you a really pretty bicolor effect. This plant will grow about two feet tall, but five feet wide. So that's gonna give you a lot of ground cover. Euonymus fortunii ermogaeti is sold and used just about everywhere because it is so easy to grow. You're just as likely to find it grown in a beautiful garden on the property of a mansion as you are at the drive-through at McDonald's. It will only get about eight to 10 inches tall unless it encounters a vertical surface and then it will want to grow up. But just give it a horizontal plane and let it go and you're going to have a great ground cover with leaves in white and green. If you're looking for green and gold, you might look for the cultivar called emerald and gold. Have you ever thought about using a evergreen fern as a ground cover? Well, I had not until a gardener suggested that I consider it. And I thought, really? But then of course, 
walk into any Pacific Northwest forest and what are you going to find? You're going to find the ground covered with ferns. So let's talk about our native fern, the Polystichnum munitum. It is a great choice for us because it will grow in any type of condition that we can throw at it, whether it be sun or shade, wet soils or dry soils. Gets about three feet tall and three feet wide. So when you cluster several of them together, you have an effective and handsome tall ground cover. Some gardeners like to cut off the old fronds in late winter to make way for the new spring growth, but that's not necessary. Deciduous trees, those trees without leaves in winter, can also give us color. The Acer palmatum bihu has lovely ever yellow bark. Some of you have heard of the coral bark maple. Well, this maple also puts on new growth that is coral color, but when the new growth ages, it turns this buttery yellow color that persists for years and years and years. It also has a lovely season of interest in spring when the leaves unfurl, they are yellow, turning to green in summer, but then in fall, they'll turn yellow and shades of orange. And speaking of yellow, how about a witch hazel? This is Arnold's promise. It reliably blooms in January with these little spidery flowers. Depending on the type of witch hazel you buy, and there are several different ones you can choose from, you can get blossoms as early as December or in January, such as this one, and then on into February and March as well. Your second season of interest is going to be in fall when you get leaves in beautiful colors of burgundy, orange, and gold. Deciduous shrubs can provide us color in winter as well, and probably the most Famous of these is the twig dogwood. As you can see here, this is Cornus alba argentio marginata, and it has green leaves with white edges, little white flowers in summer. It has beautiful fall foliage as well, but its claim to fame are those beautiful bright red stems in winter. Imagine your surprise and delight when you're driving up the driveway or looking out the window and you see these little clusters of yellow and white flowers blooming on leafless branches. This is a plant that is not used enough in our gardens. It's Edgeworthia chrysantha. The other seasons of the year, it really does provide a lovely texture in the garden too because the leaves are arranged in whorls around its branches. Not to be confused with the witch hazel, here's winter hazel. It also has flowers that bloom in late winter. And these are little white dangly lantern shaped flowers and they persist for about a month. And once they drop, it's time for the spring leaves to emerge and they have a beauty, beautiful pleated texture suffused in apricot. Herbaceous perennials and grasses can also be used to get color in winter albeit a little more subdued. A popular combination in prairie style gardens is Echinacea with Penicetum. The view you see here on the right, of course, is how it would look in late summer and fall. And on the left, then you can see the persistent seed heads of the cone flowers rising up above the feathers of the ornamental grass. And here is another combination where ornamental grasses and herbaceous perennials are used for winter color. This is Calamagrostis arcutifolia, Carl Forster, combined with Hylotelephium telephium autumn joy, the plant formerly known as sedum autumn joy. On the left, you can see those statuesque ornamental grasses framing the seed heads of the sedum. On the right, that same combination is accompanied by a couple of beautiful dwarf conifers and a red twig dogwood. Winter can be such an awesome time for color in our garden. I could go on and on, but I hope with these examples, I've convinced you that you can have a lot of color in winter. We just need to take the seasonal approach of adding and combining well-chosen evergreens and deciduous plants with multiple seasons of interest in our garden. So there we are. Once you've created the winter garden, the rest of the seasons become much easier.
Here in spring, you can see our entryway garden has 80% evergreen, just like we've been discussing now. And with the addition of a spring blooming flowering cherry, it is the epitome of color for spring. And here, more spring color with the deciduous azaleas that we see, along with the 30% evergreen bones. And a few little ornamental onions are popping their head up and the Lace leaf Japanese maples are leafing out beautifully, and all of that is anchored by that gorgeous burgundy painted bench. In summer, here we go again. I'm showing you the garden that I really think epitomizes how we can accomplish putting together a garden with 80% evergreen bones. And now we see it in summertime with a froth of white flowers edging the beds. On the right, we have an evergreen door accompanied by a couple of, or a collection, I should say, of blue glazed pots with some summer annuals. What could be more lovely for summertime? And when you think about it, you have what you need for all the other seasons of the year, lasting color, and that's what we're going for. In this view, we see the chartreuse of the Monterey Cypress there on the left, which is evergreen, and a cryptomeria black dragon in the background. And that's accompanied with a whole collection of shade-loving perennials, all under the canopy of a beautiful Japanese maple bloodgood. You don't have to have a large garden to take a seasonal approach to color. This is a summer view out the window into a little courtyard. And on the left here, we can see a painted screen in the background and a blue glazed pot in the center that has a summer blooming clematis, an ornamental grass that's Japanese forest grass and a little miniature rose tucked in there. And that's surrounded by a complement of evergreen and herbaceous plants. If we were to turn our gaze a little to the right in that same courtyard, we would see a seating area. Again, the painted screen in the background providing us some privacy and pink, pink accents with pillows on the chairs and a cut flower arrangement. I was glad I was able to find this example of a newly planted garden. I want to reiterate that it is sometimes disappointing when we first plant a garden that doesn't end up looking like what we had pictured in our mind or we saw in a magazine. But this garden has been planted with fall in mind and we can see dotted among the rocks, the ornamental grasses and one predominant perennial that we see here is the Sedum Autumn Joy. And that combination can be seen on the right. So we can well imagine what this garden is going to look like in fall. This is an example how just some well-chosen trees with great fall foliage can give us the color that we're looking for in autumn. This is a beautiful entryway garden with lots of evergreens and those beautiful autumn colors. And this garden has it all. I can't begin to tell you what's here, but there are evergreens in the background. And as you can see, some containers on the pathway there that have evergreens in them. And we see beautiful fall foliage with the Japanese maples that are in this garden. And if we were to take another look at this garden and from a different perspective, we would see a couple of other choice evergreens really holding the scene and complementing the gorgeous fall foliage of the Japanese maples. This mixed container takes a seasonal approach to color as well. We know some of these plants. We've reviewed them already. There's a Nandina in the background there. And then there is a dark leafed hookera at the one o'clock position. And forward of that is a little spill of golden lemon thyme. We also see an orange leafed hookera. And then center stage there is a beautiful variegated acanthus. So we've talked about how to pinpoint where and when your garden lacks color, and we've explored three solutions to taking a seasonal approach to boost your color quotient. We've looked at a lot of plants and some beautiful, inspiring gardens. So now it's time to wrap it up with some final thoughts to help you further in your quest for more color. Let's just start with talking about entryway gardens for just another a moment. And the first thing I would want you to consider is the color of your house when choosing your plants. 
If you have a mid to dark gray house, you can add any color you want. It will look great. But if your house is another color, you may want to consider how your plants are going to coordinate with that because your house is going to be a very significant backdrop to your entryway garden. Another thing, of course, is to remember the 80% quotient of, of plants and or non-living elements. And size does matter, particularly with entryway gardens, you might want to consider planting your plants so that you achieve a no plant zone at the base of your foundation. And this is to say, plant those plants a little farther away from the foundation than you think might be necessary. That way you leave yourself a little buffer. If you need to step into that area to wash the windows or you want to put up a ladder so that you can string your Christmas lights, so keep that in mind. Also, do check to see how tall your windows are. Most of us do not want our plants obstructing our view, and you really don't necessarily want to get into the routine of having to prune plants down, do you? So think about how tall your plants can grow at maturity and still stay below the windows. Four feet is a good rule of thumb, but do check your windows to be sure. And the final thing is to remember that people and vehicles are going to be accessing this area frequently. And so you want to plant so that you don't obstruct traffic. Don't get your plants too close to the pathways or the driveway and do consider visibility. You don't want to obstruct people's view. So what happened in this particular case? Well, we see a beautiful collection of evergreens and we certainly have our 80% evergreen guideline being met here, but perhaps the size of the garden and the plants should have been more carefully considered in the planning stages. Placement of trees is also important too. Of course, you want to look around and make sure that the roots are not going to interfere with foundations, retaining walls, sidewalks, driveways, septic systems, or drain pipes. And be sure to look up as well. You don't want to have the crown of your tree interfering with utility lines, roof, or gutters, such as what happened in this particular case. Look at this gorgeous specimen of Serbian spruce. Unfortunately, it's planted too close to the house. And evidently, it must have been in the way of the guys that were doing the lawn mowing, too, because they pruned away some of the lower branches. And just as an aside, I think that is insanity. Why would you not just remove some of the lawn instead of removing some branches? But all of that could have been avoided if you had just planted this tree 10 to 15 feet away from the house and give it a, a nice, generous bed to grow in. Well, with those thoughts in mind, let's just go through a simple process for envisioning how to add more color. And the first of these is to evaluate your project area. Take some photos. And I suggest photos because it's human nature to kind of ignore what we see every day. So if you're looking at a photo, it's pretty obvious what's there, what's good and what's not so good. So print out a few of those photos and make some notes and start trying out some ideas as to how you would like to add some color. In this particular case, I suggested that a container bite might be added to the doorway step and a Christmas tree shaped conifer in the front lawn. Also, I thought it might be nice to enlarge the bed there in front of the porch and also to take out the shrubs beside the garage door because they were gonna need constant pruning to keep them out of the way. And so instead, maybe some colorful pots there might be a better choice. Once you've done that, take out a fresh photo and a piece of tracing paper and start sketching. You don't have to be an artist to do this. You just need to have some ideas and maybe just give yourself an opportunity to see how this might come together. Once you've done that, maybe it's time to start experimenting with color combinations. So take out your colored pencils or markers and start filling in those shapes with color. And once you come to a decision on what you might like to do, go and take another look and sketch how it might look 
from another point of view. And what I did here is I imagined I was on the porch looking back at the lawn, and this is what I would see. And I was pretty happy with that, but I thought maybe another special edition would be a bird bath. So that's what that little blue thing is. So you don't have to be an artist. Now, how about sketching the view out the window? Again, let's take a photo and make some notations. We have some new homeowners here. And maybe this is one of those cases where someone doesn't want to just jump into a full-fledged makeover. So they want to just focus on a few things they could do to add a little color. And maybe non-living elements might be a way to get to that goal a little sooner rather than later. So our notes include creating garden rooms with a fence and arbor and adding a yellow tree in the far distance there and painting the shed. So if we take a look at how that might come together, this is the little drawing that we get. So once we've done our sketches and we kind of know where we want to go, let's identify what plants are going to get us there. Where I like to start is with researching plants online and one website that I use continually is greatplantpicks.org. This website includes information on hundreds of plants that have been selected by experts in the Pacific Northwest for their beauty and their adaptability to grow well in our region. So their search engine is really robust. You can put in a plant name if you know it, but if you're just looking for ideas of plants, put in the criteria that you are seeking and it will give you a list of plants that meet those qualifications. And then you'll also find lists that are already prepared for you that will help you with any type of thing that you want to accomplish, whether it's a drought tolerant garden or if it's a garden for all seasons. Lots of different choices, check it out. The other thing, of course, you could do is take your sketch to the garden center and eventually you'll probably be doing that and the professionals there would be more than happy to hear your ideas and take you to, to plants that might meet your criteria and help you make some thoughtful choices. And then, of course, you can always hire a professional, a garden designer or a garden coach. So remember when choosing what to buy, prioritize. I realize that evergreens do cost more than your typical perennials. And if you're going to be making investments in new structures with paint, those are going to cost a little bit more than the typical collection of plants that you might buy. But you want to get the most impact that you can right off the bat. So prioritize. The other is to be realistic about plant size. We've talked about that a lot already. Do plan ahead and Yes, I'm as guilty as anyone for impulse purchases when I'm at the garden center. Just check the tags, make sure that you have a place for that plant that you are so attracted to. And then the other is to invest in those non-living accents early on in the process so that you get instant impact. And finally, be patient. It takes a while to put together a colorful garden and that's okay. We're gardeners. It's about the process, not necessarily about the final product. So before we go, let's just look at a few more gardens to reinforce what we've talked about. Maybe you want a lot of color. Well, if you do, look at this example. Maybe you want a more subdued approach and this might be more to your liking. If you want primary colors, here's an example of that. And if you would like something more soothing in blues and greens, how about this? Whether your garden is small or large, the beauty and benefits of adding color to your garden really is undeniable. You can do this. And when you take a seasonal approach, you will enjoy the magic of color every day. Thank you.